This is local anesthetics. The objectives are as follows. Describe the basic structure of a local anesthetic. Discuss the binding of local anesthetics to the sodium channel. Discuss the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics of local anesthetics. Identify the different types of local anesthetic toxicity and their mechanics. Discuss measures to reduce the likelihood of local anesthetic toxicity and develop an algorithmic approach to treating local anesthetic toxicity. Local anesthetics are used to provide analgesia and anesthesia for a multitude of things. They're used during surgery, we use them during blocks, they're used to treat dysrhythmias, they're just widely used. Locals produce a reversible conduction blockade of impulses along central and peripheral nerve pathways. So the higher the concentration, the more the blockade. Sometimes it's a motor block, sometimes it's a sensory block, sometimes it's a combination of both. Carl Kohler introduced cocaine as the first local anesthetic in 1884 during an eye case. Halstead recognized its potential to interrupt nerve conduction, leading to the introduction of peripheral nerve blocks and spinal anesthesia. In 1905, Einhorn introduced the first synthetic local anesthetic. This was an ester derivative of procaine. Lidocaine was synthesized as an amide local anesthetic by Lofgren in 1943. They liked this one because it produced a more rapid, intense, and longer lasting conduction block compared to that of procaine. It's effective topically and highly effective as a cardiac antidysrhythmic. For this reason, lidocaine is the standard to which we compare pretty much all of the other local anesthetics. The commonly used local anesthetics have many structural similarities, including a lipophilic benzene ring at one end of the molecule that's going to permit diffusion through lipid bilayers and an amine end. The aromatic ring provides lipophilic characteristics, where the tertiary or quaternary amine gives hydrophilicity to the molecule. These two portions are separated by a connecting intermediate hydrocarbon chain. The lipophilic portion is essential for anesthetic activity. It is this aromatic ring that improves the lipid solubility of the local anesthetic. There needs to be some type of balance between the lipid solubility and the water solubility. The terminal amine, which is marked quaternary amine in this picture, may exist in a tertiary form that is lipid soluble or as a quaternary form that is positively charged and makes the molecule more water soluble. This terminal amine acts as an on-off switch, allowing the local anesthetic to exist in either a lipid soluble or water soluble conformation. In order for the local to be stable in solution, it exists in a quaternary water soluble state at the time of injection. This is not the part that penetrates the neuron. Once injected, the molecules convert to the tertiary lipid soluble structure at physiologic pH and they become non-ionized and they're able to penetrate the nerve. The chemical link between these moieties includes either an amide or an ester bond. The ester bond is with the CO and the amide bond is with the NHC. These link the hydrocarbon chain with the lipophilic aromatic ring. As such, these compounds are designed as either amino amides or amino esters. So these are the local anesthetics that we will be discussing. It lists the two different types, so esters and amides. The generic name is listed followed by the brand name in parentheses. So how do you memorize if it's an ester or an amide? If the generic name has two I's in the name, it is an amide. Ester does not contain an I. The important difference between ester and amide local anesthetics relate to the site of metabolism and the potential to produce allergic reactions. Clinically, drug solutions are formulated as hydrochloride salts to maintain solubility and stability. A local anesthetic can accept a hydrogen ion to form a conjugated acid, which is then positively charged and therefore is water soluble. By altering the chemical structure of a local anesthetic, you change its pharmacologic effect and it will have a different lipid solubility, potency, rate of metabolism, and duration. For example, if you substitute a butyl group for the amine group on procaine, you get tetracaine. Tetracaine is more lipid soluble and it's 10 times more potent. It also has four to five times decrease in the rate of metabolism and it has a much longer duration of action than procaine. 
you may hear the term racemic mixture or left or right-handed configuration. I will attempt to explain that now. Some of the locals like mapivacaine, bupivacaine, ropivacaine, and levobupivacaine are chiral drugs because their molecule possesses an asymmetric carbon atom. Stereoisomerism, or chirality, describes molecules with the same structural formula, but with different spatial orientations around that specific chiral center. Local anesthetics exist as either single enantiomers or as racemic mixtures, which are solutions that contain equal amounts of those two enantiomers. The two enantiomers can possess different clinically important pharmacological properties. For example, bupivacaine, a racemic mixture, has greater potential for cardiac toxicity than the single enantiomers ropivacaine and levobupivacaine. We'll leave that there for just a little bit. With the exception of levobupivacaine and ropivacaine, Local anesthetics used in clinical practice are supplied as racemic mixtures, like bupivacaine and mapivacaine, or have no asymmetrical carbons, like lidocaine, chloroprocaine, tetracaine, and benzocaine. Okay, so just a little anatomy of the nerve fiber. The axon, an extension of a centrally located neuron, is the functional unit of peripheral nerves. They're surrounded by Schwann cells who function to support and insulate them. In unmyelinated nerves, like C fibers, single Schwann cells cover several axons. In larger nerves, the Schwann cell sheath covers only one axon and has several concentric layers of myelin. Between Schwann cells are periodic segments of nerve that do not contain myelin, and these are known as the nodes of Ranvier. This is where saltatory conduction occurs. The voltage-gated sodium channels are located in these unmyelinated segments and are the primary site at which local anesthetics exert their action. Local anesthetics reversibly bind to the alpha subunit of the voltage-gated sodium channels. By plugging up that channel, it reduces sodium conductance and interrupts the creation and propagation of action potentials in the axon. They basically plug the channel, reduce sodium conductance, block nerve conduction. Pretty simple. Axons in the peripheral nerves differ in the size, structure, speed of conduction, myelination, as well as sensitivity to local anesthetics. Conduction velocity is going to be a measure of how fast an axon transmits the action potential. Myelinated nerves are larger and conduct impulses faster and are more difficult to block with local anesthetics when compared to smaller or unmyelinated nerves like C fibers. Keep in mind when you're looking at this table that the block regression occurs in the opposite direction of block onset. If they're the first to go to sleep, they're the last to wake up. So that was anatomy, let's do physiology. Voltage-gated sodium channels are found only in the nerve's axon. The voltage-gated sodium channels are membrane-associated proteins comprising one large sodium-conducting alpha subunit through which the sodium ions pass and a varying number of beta subunits. These sodium channels and peripheral nerve axons can produce and transmit membrane depolarization following chemical, mechanical, or electrical stimuli. Sodium channels exist in multiple conformations depending upon the membrane potential. They have channels that exist in the open or activated state, closed or inactivated state, or the resting state. Neurons maintain a resting membrane potential of negative 60 to negative 70 millivolts. At resting membrane potential, they are closed. Excitable cells have the unusual capability of generating action potentials. The sodium potassium pump couples the transport of three sodium ions out of the cell for every two potassium ions into the cell. Remember, it's three to two, so this creates a concentration gradient that makes a cell want to restore balance and move potassium back out of the cell and sodium back into the cell. This is why the resting membrane potential is a little negative. There are just more positive ions outside of the cell than inside of the cell. When threshold potential is reached, there's a brief conformational change and the channel opens. During this conformational change, sodium ions are able to enter and this generates an action potential. 
the increase in sodium permeability causes a temporary depolarization of the membrane potential to around 35 millivolts. This is the active state. Like I said, this is a brief conformational change, and once it conforms back, sodium can no longer enter and the membrane returns to its resting potential. This is the inactive state. Keep in mind, the sodium potassium pump keeps everything in check most of the time, so only a very small amount of sodium ions are able to pass into the cell during the action potential. Once there's a return to resting membrane potential, the channel is converted from the inactive state to the resting state and the nerve's ready to be stimulated again. So just a brief recap. Sodium channels open, allow sodium to flux into the cell, depolarizing the membrane. When a sufficient number is open, the threshold potential will be reached and an action potential will be generated. After opening, sodium channels rapidly inactivate, terminating that sodium influx. Termination of the sodium flux quickly leads to repolarization, favoring the channel's resumption to that resting state. Local anesthetics cannot bind to sodium channels if they are in their resting state. When bound to a sodium channel, local anesthetics are going to inhibit sodium flux. When a sufficient number of channels have been bound to local anesthetics, the extent of depolarization is reduced sufficiently such that a threshold potential cannot be reached. If the neuronal membrane fails to be depolarized to the threshold potential, an action potential cannot be produced. Impulses will not be propagated, and a conduction block has been achieved. Local anesthetics have a greater affinity for the sodium channel in the open or inactivated state than the resting state. Repetitive depolarizations increase the likelihood of channels being in the open or inactivated state and therefore increase the likelihood of local anesthetics binding. Depolarizations lead to an open and inactivated channels, Therefore, depolarization favors local anesthetic binding. The fraction of sodium channels that bind a local anesthetic increases with the frequency of depolarization. Basically, the more nerve fibers that are depolarizing, the greater the local anesthetic is binding. Local anesthetics just prevent action potentials from occurring. They do not alter the resting membrane or the threshold potential. The sodium ion channels tend to recover from local anesthetic-induced conduction blockade between those action potentials. Additional conduction blockade is developed each time the sodium channel opens during the action potential. Local anesthetics also block voltage-dependent potassium and calcium ion channels, although to a much lesser degree. Potassium is going to be what regulates the resting membrane potential. Calcium is going to be what regulates the threshold potential. There's a set minimum concentration of local anesthetic that's necessary to produce a conduction blockade of nerve impulses, and it's written as CM. The CM is like the MAC of our volatile agents, or the ED50 of our intravenous drugs. Nerve fiber diameter influences the concentration of local anesthetic that's needed. Larger nerve fibers require higher concentrations and longer exposure of local anesthetics in order to block conduction. Fibers that are more resistant to local anesthetic blockade have a higher CM. Fibers that are more easily blocked have a lower CM. An increase in tissue pH or a high frequency of nerve stimulation also decreases the CM. The nerve fibers are going to be classified according to diameter, the presence or absence of myelin, and function. Larger diameter nerves have a more rapid conduction of action potentials and myelin, which forces current to flow through the nodes of Rambier and also increases conduction velocity. For these myelinated axons, two to three nodes of Rambier must be blocked in order to stop nerve conduction. In general, smaller diameter fibers have increased sensitivity to local anesthetics when compared with larger fibers and faster conducting fibers are less sensitive than slower conducting fibers. In a human peripheral nerve, the onset of local anesthetic inhibition generally follows autonomic before sensory before motor. The order of neuronal blockade that you'll see in clinical practice proceeds as a loss of sympathetic transmission followed by pain, temperature, touch, proprioception, and then skeletal tone. The CM of motor fibers is approximately twice that of sensory fibers. 
This is why you do not always get a motor block even when you have a good sensory block. Local anesthetics are weak bases that almost all have a pKa value just a little above the physiologic pH of 7.4. When they're placed in solution, they dissociate into an uncharged base and its conjugate acid. Only the ionized conjugate acid binds to the local anesthetic alpha subunit on the inside of the voltage-gated sodium channel. The sodium channel will remain closed until enough local anesthetic diffuses away. Now on to the tricky part. Their pKa range is 7.6 to 9.1. The pKa is defined as the pH at which 50% of the molecules exist in the unionized lipid soluble form and 50% are in the ionized water soluble form. Another way to say this is when 50% exists in the lipid soluble tertiary form and 50% in the quaternary water soluble form. Weak acids become more unionized when the pH decreases and more ionized when the pH increases. Weak bases become more unionized when the pH increases and more ionized when the pH decreases. In other words, when they're exposed to an environment with a pH less than the pKa, like the physiologic pH of 7.4, when this occurs, a greater fraction of the local anesthetic molecule is going to be ionized. When pKa values uniformly are greater than 7.4, you can then say that local anesthetics exist with a greater proportion in the ionized form at physiologic pH. For example, if a weak acid becomes more than 50% unionized following intravenous injection, the pKa of the drug would have to be higher than the physiologic pH. For this reason, if you look at a weak base instead when injected, any of the local anesthetics that we currently use would be less than 50% unionized. So there's 25 different ways to say the same exact thing. Acidosis, like what occurs when tissue is infected, further increases the ionized fraction of the drug. This is why it's often difficult to localize an infected area effectively. Local anesthetics with pKs near the physiologic pH have a rapid onset of action because a larger fraction of the molecules will exist as the lipid-soluble, uncharged base, and more molecules will be able to diffuse across the axolemma to begin working. The lower the pK, the faster it will work. The onset of action of local anesthetics also depends on the route of administration and the dose or concentration of the drug. For example, local anesthetics that are injected into the cerebrospinal fluid reach the targets quickly because of the lack of sheath around the nerve roots. This is why a spinal anesthetic has a faster onset than what you would see with a peripheral nerve block. In a spinal, it's the B fibers that are blocked first. A differential blockade refers to how susceptible nerve fibers are to local anesthetic conduction blocks. What has been demonstrated in vivo in a lab is likely going to vary a little from what you see clinically, so this is just something that you're going to have to memorize. In vivo, local anesthetics inhibit B fibers, followed by C fibers, followed by A delta fibers, followed by A alpha fibers. Under most circumstances, the nerves that are blocked first, again, will be the slowest to recover. The absorption of a local anesthetic from its site of injection into the systemic circulation is influenced by the site of injection and dosage, the use of epinephrine, and the pharmacologic characteristics of the drug. The plasma concentration of a local anesthetic is determined by the rate of tissue distribution and the rate of clearance of the drug. The potency of a local anesthetic is determined by and is directly proportional to its lipid solubility. Agents that are lipophilic tend to be more potent and have a longer duration of action. Higher concentrations are necessary for less potent anesthetics in order to achieve neuroblockade. Bupivacaine is more lipid soluble and has about four times more potency than lidocaine. It's also found in 0.25% or 0.5% solution, whereas lidocaine is formulated in 1 to 2% solution. This table lists the relative potency of local anesthetics for different clinical applications. 
Again, this is one of those tables that may vary a little from textbook to textbook. The duration of action of local anesthetics is determined primarily by protein binding. It's also influenced by the rate of vascular uptake of local anesthetics from the injection site. Absorption into the systemic circulation is going to remove the local anesthetic from its site of action and contribute to the termination of its effect. Local anesthetics with a higher affinity for proteins remain bound to the sodium channel longer. Keep in mind, the non-ionized and the ionized forms of local anesthetic are both required for a conduction blockade. It's the non-ionized portion that diffuses across the membrane into the axon and the ionized form that actually attaches to the inside of the sodium channel to lock them shut in that inactivated position. Protein binding of local anesthetics will influence duration of action. Like other drugs, local anesthetics vary in their tendency to bind with plasma proteins. In the case of a weak base, this is usually alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. The acidic drugs are more likely to bind to albumin. The property of protein binding correlates with their affinity for protein within the sodium channels and predicts the duration they will sustain their neural blockade. Locals like bupivacaine and tetracaine have the greatest protein binding and the longer acting of the locals that we use. Injection of a local anesthetic at a highly vascular site, such as the intercostal space, has a higher rate of vascular uptake, leading to a shorter duration of action. Ultimately, the local anesthetic will be eliminated from the plasma by some type of metabolism and excretion, but there are often other organ systems involved. The lungs are capable of extracting local anesthetics such as lidocaine and bupivacaine from the circulation. The pulmonary extraction will limit the concentration of the drug that reaches a systemic circulation for distribution to the coronary and cerebral circulations. The poor water solubility of local anesthetics usually limits renal excretion of unchanged drug to less than 5%. Amide local anesthetics undergo varying rates of metabolism by microsomal P450 enzymes that are located primarily in the liver. The metabolism of amides is more complex and slower than ester anesthetics. This slower metabolism increases the chance of systemic toxicity and the cumulative drug effects with amides. Let's take a look at the two different groups, amides and esters. We'll start with the esters. These local anesthetics are predominantly metabolized by pseudocholinesterase. Cocaine is the exception, and it's metabolized in the plasma and also substantially by liver esterases. Theoretically, a patient with a pseudocholinesterase deficiency should avoid esters, but clinically, you do not usually see a problem. Ester hydrolysis is rapid, and the water-soluble metabolites are excreted in the urine. Procaine and benzocaine are metabolized to paraaminobenzoic acid, or PABA, which is the likely culprit in allergic reactions to ester local anesthetics. If your patient tells you that they're allergic to local anesthetics, find out which one it was and what their reaction was. A true allergy to a local anesthetic is actually pretty rare. Most commonly, they'll say that they had flushing and a racing heart after they went to the dentist and got a numbing shot. This was likely the systemic absorption of the epinephrine that was added to the local. If it was an ester anesthetic and they had a reaction to it, there is no cross sensitivity to an amide anesthetic. The preservatives methylparaben, propylparaben, and metabisulfite can all produce a true allergic reaction. These preservatives chemically all resemble PABA. Amide anesthetics are metabolized by carboxyl esterase and by microsomal P450 enzymes in the liver. The rate of amide metabolism depends on the specific agent, but overall is consistently slower than ester hydrolysis of ester local anesthetics. You can see here, prilocaine greater than lidocaine, greater than mepivacaine, greater than ropivacaine, greater than bupivacaine. Decreases in hepatic function or in the liver blood flow will reduce the rate of amide metabolism. Again, the allergic potential to this class is extremely rare. Let's look at each of the anesthetics individually. Procaine was the first injectable local anesthetic and is a derivative of paraaminobenzoic acid. 
It has a high pKa and poor lipid solubility. It also has a slow onset of action and a very short duration of action, around 30 to 60 minutes. Because of its less than desirable attributes that I just mentioned, it also had a very high incidence of causing allergic reactions. So for this reason, it's rarely used in clinical practice and the quest for a better local continued. I'm going to give you max doses as we go along for all of these locals. The max dose is going to vary between textbooks, so this is a general consensus. These are the numbers that I want you to use for the test. So the max dose of procaine is seven milligrams per kilogram, and texts range from 350 to 600 milligrams total. Lidocaine has been used safely and effectively for every possible type of local anesthetic procedure and is currently the standard agent. It's used commonly for infiltration in concentrations of 0.5 to 2% and for peripheral nerve blocks if an intermediate duration is required. Lidocaine 5% has been used for subarachnoid anesthesia, but the degree of spread is unpredictable and the duration of action is relatively short. This concentration has also been implied in neurotoxicity, although other studies have demonstrated that it can be used safely. In concentrations of 1 to 2%, lidocaine produces epidural anesthesia with a short onset of time. Lidocaine 2 to 4% is used as a topical solution of the upper airway before procedures like a fiber optic intubation. The principal metabolic pathway of lidocaine is oxidative dealkylation in the liver. Hepatic disease or decreases in the hepatic blood flow, which may occur during anesthesia, can decrease the rate of metabolism of lidocaine. Decreased hepatic metabolism of lidocaine should be anticipated when patients are anesthetized with volatile anesthetics. It only makes sense that they're likely going to have a soft blood pressure. The maximum dose recommended for lidocaine is 4.5 to 5 milligrams per kilogram or 300 milligrams for plain lidocaine and 7 milligrams per kilogram or 500 milligrams of lidocaine with epinephrine. Now there is an exception to the maximum rule and this is with tumescent anesthesia like what you see in plastic surgery and some burn surgeries. Tumescent anesthesia helps with making the patient comfortable and the procedure a little easier. A dilute solution of sodium chloride, lidocaine, and epinephrine and bicarbonate is injected into the adipose tissue. The lidocaine acts as a local, the epi minimizes the vascular uptake of all the solutions, and the bicarbonate is a buffer. This large volume firms up the adipose tissue and makes it easier to remove. Under normal circumstances, the maximum dose of lidl with epi would be 7 mg per kilogram. But for tumescent anesthesia, the maximum dose is 50 to 55 mg per kilogram, depending on the textbook that you're reading. A MAC anesthetic can be used if only a small volume of tumescent is used, but if it's going to be more than 2 to 3 liters, then a general anesthetic is recommended. Fluid overload and pulmonary edema are a concern as a result of the potential intravascular volume expansion, so pay close attention to fluid management. Prilocaine is an amide anesthetic that is either metabolized or sequestered to a greater degree by the lungs and is more rapidly metabolized by the liver to O-toluidine. Orthotoluidine is an oxidizing compound that's capable of converting hemoglobin to its oxidized form methemoglobin. When the dose of prilocaine is greater than 600 milligrams, there may be sufficient methemoglobin present to cause the patient to appear cyanotic and oxygen carrying capacity will be decreased. Methemoglobinemia is readily reversed by the administration of methylene blue, 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram IV over 5 minutes. Prilocaine causes less vasodilatation than the other local anesthetics and can be utilized without epinephrine being added. The maximum recommended dose is 8 mg per kilogram, or 500 mg if the patient is less than 70 kg, or 600 mg if the patient is greater than 70 kg. You may have heard of Imla cream. 5% Imla is a 50-50 combination of 2.5% lidocaine and 2.5% prilocaine. It has a low melting point which facilitates absorption, 
so an occlusive dressing should be applied after its application for the best results. It produces analgesia within one hour and achieves maximum effects after two to three hours. It should only be applied to intact skin. It should not be put on mucous membranes and should be avoided with skin conditions like eczema or psoriasis because the risk of toxicity can be increased. Nitroglycerin may be applied simultaneously to hasten the absorption of emla. Mepivacaine has pharmacologic properties similar to those of lidocaine, but with a longer duration of action. Compared to lidocaine, mepivacaine lacks vasodilator activity and can be used as an alternate selection when the administration of epinephrine to the local anesthetic needs to be avoided. The maximum recommended dose is 7 mg per kilogram, or 400 mg total. Bupivacaine metabolism occurs through hydroxylation, dealkylation, hydrolysis, and conjugation. Relative to potency, its acute central nervous system toxicity is only slightly lower than that of lidocaine, but its longer duration of action reduces the need for repeated doses, and thus the risk of cumulative toxicity. Bupivacaine can be used for infiltration, although only in small doses because of the risk of toxicity. It is used frequently for peripheral nerve blockade and for subarachnoid and epidural anesthesia because of its prolonged duration of action. Bupivacaine 0.25% to 0.5% is very common during use for epidural anesthesia, and 0.5% or 0.75% with dextrose is often used for spinal anesthetics. The maximum recommended dose is 2.5 mg per kilogram or 175 mg plain or 3 mg per kilogram or 200 mg with epinephrine. Ropivacaine is metabolized by hepatic cytochrome P450 enzymes. It is similar chemically to bupivacaine, except the butyl group attached to the amine is replaced by a propyl group. It is also presented as a single S enantiomer. Clearance of ropivacaine is higher than that of bupivacaine and its elimination halftime is shorter. It produces less of a motor blockade than bupivacaine, which is beneficial for obstetric patients who often get very anxious if they can't move their legs around for long periods of time. Ropivacaine dissociates from the sodium channels more rapidly than bupivacaine, making the chances of systemic toxicity less of a concern. Its lipid solubility is between that of lidocaine and bupivacaine, and the maximum recommended dose is 3 mg per kilogram or 200 mg total. Dibucane is a quinoline derivative with an amide bond in the connecting chain. It is metabolized in the liver and is the most slowly eliminated of all of the amide derivatives. Dibucane is better known for its ability to inhibit the activity of normal plasma cholinesterase by more than 70%, compared with only approximately 20% inhibition of the activity of atypical enzymes. Atypical plasma cholinesterase account for prolonged effects and toxicity of drugs such as succinylcholine and chloroprocaine that are metabolized by this enzyme. Laboratory evaluation of patients suspected of having atypical pseudocholinesterase is facilitated by the measurement of the degree of enzyme suppression by dibucane. Basically, dibucane depresses the activity of pseudocholinesterase. If pseudocholinesterase is normal, Dibucane will depress the activity of pseudocholinesterase by 70 to 85 percent. The percent that dibucane depresses pseudocholinesterase is called the dibucane number. The normal dibucane number is usually between 80 or 80 percent depression. The range corresponding to normal, though, is 70 to 85. If the dibucane number is 20, the individual is homozygous for the abnormal pseudocholinesterase. If the dibucane number is 30 to 70, the individual is considered heterozygous for the abnormal pseudocholinesterase. Dibucane is approximately 15 times more toxic than procaine, and for this reason, it is not used clinically because of the risk of toxicity. Chloroprocaine is an ester local anesthetic that is widely used in clinical practice, specifically OB. Its profile is very similar to that of procaine, from which it differs only by the addition of a chlorine atom. As a result, it is hydrolyzed four times faster by cholinesterase and seems to be less allergenic. 
It is claimed to have a more rapid onset than any other agent, but this may relate to its very low toxicity, which permits the use of relatively larger doses. There has been some concern that chloroprocaine might be neurotoxic because of several reports of paraplegia after accidental intrathecal injection. However, the evidence suggests that it was the preservative in the solution that caused the problems, not really the drug itself. Regardless, chloroprocaine is not used in spinal anesthesia. Chloroprocaine also does not undergo any protein binding. The max dose is 11 mg per kilogram plain, with a total max dose of 800 mg, and 14 mg per kilogram with epinephrine. Tetracaine undergoes hydrolysis by plasma cholinesterase, but the rate is lower than that for procaine. Due to its very slow hydrolysis, it is also considered relatively toxic. It is the most potent of the ester local anesthetics. Fenzacaine is unique among clinically useful local anesthetics. Despite it being a local anesthetic, it is listed in some textbooks as being a weak acid. However, with its low pKa of 3.5 and it being predominantly non-ionized at physiologic pH, and the fact that it ends with hydrochloride, we're still going to call it a weak base. And I did say a pKa of 3.5, which is the only one well below physiologic pH. Cocaine has no role in modern anesthetic practice, although it is used in ear, nose, and throat surgery for its vasoconstriction action. They call it blue magic. It's the only local anesthetic that has vasoconstricting properties. Cocaine is metabolized by plasma and liver cholinesterases to water-soluble metabolites. I don't think I have to explain the abuse potential of cocaine as an anesthetic, but cocaine abuse and intoxication is widespread across the globe. Cocaine produces sympathetic nervous system stimulation by blocking the presynaptic uptake of norepinephrine and dopamine, which increases their postsynaptic concentration. Because of this, Excessive sympathetic nervous system simulation is the primary risk of cocaine toxicity. Because of this blocking effect, dopamine remains at high concentrations in the synapse and continues to affect adjacent neurons producing the characteristic cocaine high. The max dose of cocaine is 1.5 to 3 mg per kilogram, not to exceed 150 to 200 mg, but sources do vary. Cocaine is known to cause coronary vasospasm, myocardial ischemia and infarction, and ventricular cardiac dysrhythmias. The associated hypertension and tachycardia further increases myocardial oxygen demands at a time when coronary oxygen delivery is decreased by the effects of cocaine on coronary blood flow. Cocaine should be used with caution, if at all, in patients with hypertension or coronary artery disease and in patients receiving drugs that potentiate the effects of catecholamines like MAOIs, tricyclic antidepressants, and even other sympathomimetic drugs. Treatment for cocaine-induced myocardial ischemia is best achieved with nitroglycerin or nitroprusside. There is evidence that beta blockers can accentuate coronary artery vasospasm in the setting of an acute cocaine overdose and the administration of these antihypertensives in the presence of catecholamine-induced hypertension and tachycardia has been associated with profound cardiovascular collapse and cardiac arrest. This typically is unresponsive even to aggressive cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Once you block beta, there is unopposed alpha-1 stimulation. When you have unopposed alpha-1, you get high systemic vascular resistance and you beta block and reduce inotropy and this kind of sets the stage for disaster. If you have to use a beta blocker, pick a mixed beta like labetalol that has some mixed alpha properties. In 2008, the American Heart Association published a statement for the management of cocaine-associated chest pain and myocardial infarction. This is a chart from your book that gives the clinical uses, concentrations, onset, duration, and recommended maximum single dose of the local anesthetics. This is really a chart that you need to understand and know very well. Like I mentioned, sometimes the max dose, etc., may differ very slightly, so just use what I give you on the slides. Let's talk about additives. Additives for local anesthetics are selected based on their ability to prolong duration, 
hasten onset, provide supplemental pain relief, and improve drug transfer through the tissues. The pH of commercial preparations of local anesthetic solutions range from 3.9 to 6.5, and it is especially acidic if epinephrine is included. The increased acidity prolongs the shelf life of epinephrine. Epinephrine is likely the additive that you will see the most. The duration of action of a local anesthetic is proportional to the time that the drug is in contact with those nerve fibers. The alpha-1 agonist effect makes it a very potent vasoconstrictor, which can decrease the systemic uptake and prolong the block duration and enhance the block quality because the drug is in contact with the nerve longer. Epinephrine does a better job of prolonging local anesthetics of intermediate duration when compared to those of long duration. It extends the block with lidocaine more so than the block with bupivacaine. When epinephrine 1 to 200,000 or 5 mics per mil is added, the vasoconstriction that is produced limits the systemic absorption and maintains the drug concentration in the vicinity of the nerve fibers. Epinephrine may also enhance conduction blockade by increasing neuronal uptake of the local anesthetic. The book says that the addition of epinephrine to local anesthetic solution has little, if any, effect on the onset rate of the local anesthetic. I'm letting you know that this may not be what you see all the time clinically. I personally think that there is a noticeable difference between a spinal setting up if you add epinephrine to it. Epinephrine-containing solutions should not be injected into tissues supplied by arteries because that resulting vasoconstriction can produce ischemia and may result in tissue necrosis. You can remember this by this highly inappropriate rhyme, eyes, ears, nose, toes, and hose. Epinephrine can enhance the block quality and provide supplemental analgesia via those alpha-2 agonistic effects. Alkalinization of local anesthetic solutions increases the number of lipid-soluble molecules so it speeds up the onset of action of the neural block. It also enhances the depth of sensory and motor blockade and increases the spread of epidural blocks. There is a limit to how much of the local anesthetic solution can be alkalized before it starts to precipitate, so this technique is only going to produce modest results you can mix 1 mil of 8.4% sodium bicarbonate with 10 mils of local anesthetic. Alkalization increases the percentage of local anesthetic that's existing in that lipid-soluble form and increases the quality of the block. By adding sodium bicarbonate, it will speed up the onset of peripheral nerve blocks and epidural blocks by approximately 3 to 5 minutes. The ability of dexamethasone to extend the local anesthetic duration of action correlates with its glucocorticoid activity. It acts on the steroid receptor and or affects the systemic uptake of the local anesthetic. It can increase the duration of a brachial plexus block by up to 50%. The low molecular weight dextran can also prolong block duration by decreasing systemic uptake of the local anesthetic. Dexmedetomidine has been used as an adjunct to local anesthetics and is useful in prolonging the block as well as improved postoperative analgesia. It seems to increase both the sensory and motor block and in several studies has shown to prolong the time before a patient first requests pain medication after a spinal. The same results have been shown when clonidine, magnesium, and even ketamine have been added to the regional anesthesia. Clonidine produces analgesia via its alpha-2 agonism in the brain and spinal cord. 100 mics can be added to local anesthetic solutions. We will talk a little bit more about this in obstetric pharmacology, but opioids provide supplemental analgesia for spinal and epidural anesthetics. There is mixed reviews when it is added for peripheral nerve blocks. Chloroprocaine is the exception. It reduces the effectiveness of opioids in the epidural space, so we do not add opioids to chloroprocaine. Hyaluronic acid hinders the spread of substances through tissues. Hyaluronidase hydrolyzes hyaluronic acid, which facilitates the diffusion of substances in the tissues. It is commonly used in ophthalmic blocks to increase the speed of onset, enhance the block quality, and mitigate any rise in intraocular pressure. 
It can also reduce hematoma size and decrease the risk of postoperative strabismus. It does carry some allergic potential. Anytime we put a drug in or on the body, there's the potential for some type of adverse reaction. The principal side effects related to local anesthetics are generally allergic reactions and systemic toxicity. It's estimated that less than 1% of all adverse reactions to local anesthetics are due to an allergic mechanism. Like I mentioned before, it is likely a reaction to excess plasma concentrations of the local anesthetic or to the epinephrine if they happen to have epi added. Esters are more likely to cause an allergic reaction than amides. The reaction, again, is likely due to the preservative that is structurally similar to PABA. As a result, an allergic reaction may reflect prior stimulation of antibody production by the preservative and not necessarily a reaction to the local anesthetic. The occurrence of a rash, urticaria, and swelling of the airway with or without hypotension and bronchospasm all point toward an actual local anesthetic-induced allergic reaction. If the symptoms are hypotension associated with syncope or tachycardia when an epinephrine-containing local anesthetic solution is administered, this suggests an accidental intravascular injection of the drug. Local anesthetic systemic toxicity is due to an excessive plasma concentration of the drug. A higher amount of vascular uptake contributes to a higher plasma concentration. Plasma concentrations of local anesthetics are determined by the rate of drug entrance into the systemic circulation relative to the redistribution of inactive tissue sites and clearance by metabolism. The total dose, not its concentration or speed of injection, determine the plasma concentration. 100 mg of bupivacaine is 100 mg of bupivacaine, whether you inject 80 mL of 0.125% or 20 mils of half percent. The accidental intravascular injection during a peripheral nerve block or epidural anesthesia is the most common mechanism for production of excessive plasma concentrations of local anesthetics. The magnitude of this systemic absorption depends on the dose administered into the tissues, the vascularity of the injection site, the presence of epinephrine in the solution, and the physiochemical properties of the drug. The rates of local anesthetic systemic absorption and rise of local anesthetic concentrations in the blood are related to the vascularity of the sites of injection and generally follow the order that I have listed for you here. Local anesthetics differ with regards to CNS toxicity and cardiac toxicity potential. The threshold plasma concentration at which CNS toxicity occurs may be related more to the rate of increase of the serum concentration than to the total amount of the drug that's actually injected. Initially, you will see restlessness, vertigo, tinnitus, and difficulty focusing. Low plasma concentrations of local anesthetics are likely to produce numbness of the tongue and circumoral tissues because these tissues are just very highly vascular. As the plasma concentrations continue to rise, local anesthetics readily cross the blood-brain barrier and produce a predictable pattern of CNS changes. Further increases in CNS concentrations will result in slurred speech and skeletal muscle twitching. Patients have also reported having feelings of imminent death and impending doom. You need to know this chart. Lidocaine will produce seizures when the plasma concentration is around 10 to 15 mics per mil. Bupivacaine, in contrast, will progress right to cardiac arrest because of its toxicity. The seizures may reflect selective depression of inhibitory cortical neurons by local anesthetics that leave the excitatory pathways unopposed. The cardiovascular system is more resistant to the toxic effects of high plasma concentrations of local anesthetics than the central nervous system. Part of the cardiac toxicity that results from high plasma concentrations occurs because these drugs also block cardiac sodium channels. At low concentrations, this effect on sodium channels probably contributes to the cardiac antidysrhythmic properties. Bupivacaine is a dangerous one because it has a greater affinity for these voltage-gated sodium channels and a slower rate of dissociation from the receptor, allowing for bupivacaine to remain at that receptor for a longer period of time. These locals decrease automaticity, 
conduction velocity, action potential duration, and the effective refractory period. Locals produce different effects on the vascular smooth muscle depending on the dose that is given. Low concentrations produce vasoconstriction, while higher doses produce vasodilatation and reduction in systemic vascular resistance. The accidental intravascular injection of bupivacaine may result in precipitous hypotension and AV block. Dysrhythmias include premature ventricular contractions and widening of the QRS complex in ventricular tachycardia. Cardiotoxic plasma concentrations of bupivacaine are around 8 to 10 mics per mil. All local anesthetics depress the maximal depolarization rate of the cardiac action potential by their ability to inhibit sodium ion influx via the sodium channels. If you have the ability to cause it, you have to know how to treat it. The treatment of local anesthetic systemic toxicity has undergone swift changes in the last decade and includes the prompt airway management, circulatory support, and mechanisms to remove local anesthetic from the receptor sites. Treatment should be initiated as soon as possible. If local anesthetic-induced seizures occur, the patient should be ventilated with oxygen because arterial hypoxemia and metabolic acidosis occur within seconds. For a patient who has progressed to severe CNS toxicity or cardiovascular collapse, the patient's airway should be secured and the patient should be adequately ventilated with oxygen in order to ensure adequate oxygenation and prevent acidosis. Factors that increase the risk of CNS toxicity include hypercarbia, hyperkalemia, and metabolic acidosis. Hypercarbia increases blood flow to the brain and decreases protein binding, which increases the free fraction of the drug that is available to cross the blood-brain barrier. Hyperkalemia raises the resting membrane potential, making them more likely to depolarize. Acidosis lowers the seizure threshold and favors ion trapping inside of the brain. Factors that decrease the risk are hypocarbia, hypokalemia, and central nervous system depressants. Since hypocarbia decreases cerebral blood flow, a respiratory rate on the higher side may actually be helpful. Hypokalemia lowers the resting membrane potential, so a larger stimulus is required to depolarize the nerve. CNS depressants raise the seizure threshold. For patients with seizure activity, suppression should include a benzodiazepine such as Versed, Valium, or Ativan as the first-line agent. Now the book and APEX says that propofol should be avoided in patients with hemodynamic instability as it is a cardiovascular depressant and its lipid content is insufficient to treat toxicity. However, clinically, if that's all you have readily available to stop a seizure, I would personally use that. If the seizures are unresponsive to initial treatment, muscle relaxants like succinylcholine or non-depolarizing blockers can be used, but remember the patient still needs to be sedated. Lipid rescue with 20% lipid emulsion is a treatment of choice for patients with cardiovascular collapse from bupivacaine, ropivacaine, or etidocaine. Initiation of lipid therapy after other resuscitation drugs have been administered may delay recovery and there appears to be almost no downside of patients receiving unnecessary lipids. These lipids act as an intravascular reservoir that sequesters the local anesthetic and reduces the plasma concentration. It also enhances myocardial fatty acid metabolism, increases calcium influx, and impairs the local anesthetic from binding to the voltage-gated sodium channels. Treatment includes an initial bolus of 1.5 mils per kilogram of 20% lipid emulsion over one minute, followed by a 0.25 mils per kilogram per minute infusion for at least 10 minutes after circulatory stability is attained. If symptoms are slow to resolve, you can repeat the bolus up to two more times and increase the infusion rate to 0.5 mils per kilogram per minute. The maximum recommended dose is 10 mils per kilogram in the first 30 minutes. Epinephrine boluses should be kept at 1 mic per kilo or less. That's around 10 to 100 mics at a time, and vasopressin use is not recommended. You should also avoid any type of calcium channel blocker or beta blocker, although the patient is normally hypotensive, 
so you probably wouldn't be administering these drugs anyway. If ventricular arrhythmias are present, you want to avoid lidocaine, obviously, and procainamide. Amiodarone is probably your best bet. Non-responsive treatment should prompt the patient being placed on cardiopulmonary bypass if available. I mentioned this briefly before, but let's take another look at met hemoglobinemia. This is a rare but potentially life-threatening complication that may follow the administration of certain drugs or chemicals that cause the oxidation of hemoglobin to met hemoglobin more rapidly than met hemoglobin can be reduced to hemoglobin. The presence of met hemoglobin decreases the oxygen carrying capacity in two ways. Met hemoglobin cannot bind to oxygen molecules, and when the hemoglobin iron moieties are oxidized, which shifts the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the left, it will decrease oxygen unloading to the tissues. It absorbs 660 and 940 nanometer infrared wavelengths, the same as oxyhemoglobin, so a significant concentration of met hemoglobin can lead to pulse oximetry measurement errors, typically with an SpO2 reading of 85%. A co-oximeter has to be used in order to diagnose met hemoglobinemia. Known substances include topical anesthetics like benzocaine, cetacaine, prilocaine, and lidocaine, or emlocrine, nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, phenytoin, and the sulfonamides. The concentration of met hemoglobin is directly related to the severity of the condition. It normally constitutes less than 1% of the total hemoglobin. Central cyanosis usually occurs when met hemoglobin concentrations exceed 15%. Cyanosis in the presence of a normal PaO2 is highly suggestive of this condition. Other signs and symptoms include things like hypoxia, chocolate-colored blood, tachycardia, tachypnea, mental status changes, coma, and death. Met hemoglobinemia can be reversed with the methylene blue dosage described before, but the total dosage should not exceed 7 to 8 milligrams per kilogram. Results are typically seen within 20 to 60 minutes. The methylene blue was metabolized to form leukomethylene blue. This metabolite functions as an electron donor, which reduces met hemoglobin back to hemoglobin. The therapeutic effect may be short-lived because the methylene blue may be cleared before all of the met hemoglobin is converted back to hemoglobin. Additionally, continuous absorption of highly lipophilic local anesthetics like benzocaine from the fat may continue to occur after the methylene blue plasma concentrations are no longer therapeutic. Patients with glucose 6-phosphate reductase deficiency do not possess met hemoglobin reductase, so an exchange transfusion may be required. Fetal hemoglobin is relatively deficient in this reductase enzyme as well, making them at a higher risk for toxicity due to more readily oxidized fetal hemoglobin. This is a little cheat sheet that I put together for you that gives a rundown of the concepts listed earlier. These are some helpful slides with some charts that you need to know.